beautiful. I'd never heard that before. And uh, the words were beautiful. And uh, it goes right along with one of the, some things I wanted to talk about right now. You know, I talked to you this morning, and it's exciting. And it's a, it's a thrill and a privilege to serve the Lord, right? Amen. Now, does that mean it's all going to be a bed of roses? Am I going to get up every morning with a smile on my face and all excited today I get to serve the Lord? Not on your life. For, I went through a period of time that about every six months I got malaria. And uh, I stopped counting at about 24 times the times I got malaria. So life is not always a bed of roses. And uh, it's not always, it's not always the, the exciting, exciting things that I talked about this morning. It's not, that's not, that, that, that doesn't happen every day. I mean, God gives a lot of exciting things to happen, but you know, they're, they're discouraging times. And I want for the young people especially to know that uh, no matter who you are, if you live very long, you're going to have some really discouraging times. But I say this quite often to young people, wouldn't you rather be discouraged in God's will than out of God's will? Uh, let me ask you a, a very personal question and see how good you are at being open and honest. How many of you have ever been angry at God? <laughs> I had a preacher friend once and said he didn't believe you could be saved very long if you hadn't gotten angry at God. Well, you know, I want to share with you an experience that uh, I, uh, when I went to the field, for the first 10 years, I was in the Mimika tribe, a very difficult people to work with. They were not interested. They wanted me there because I had fish hooks and <laughs> fish line. And, uh, but they uh, were not interested in the gospel. They had had Catholicism for 25 years, and Catholic says you can keep your old way of life and you can just add this to it. And here I come in and said you can't continue your spirit worship and this sort of thing. And so but they were very, very difficult to work with. And there were two of us there, Marge Smith and I, we were there. And I decided this is where God wants me, and I'm going to spend the rest of my life here. I'm, I'm very stubborn. God has to move me. He has to, he has to make me move. And I was going to be there forever. And Marge, we came on furlough, and Marge didn't return because of, of illness in her family, and she was the only child. And I went back alone, thinking, well, Marge will be back in a couple of months. And so I, I, was, I kept strung out for two years. A very isolated place. I'd go maybe six weeks, never see a white person. The pilot then would come in with the precious mailbag and uh, supplies, and I would talk his ears off because... I had, you know, you hadn't seen a white person. I'd beg him to stay for lunch no matter what time of day it was. You know? <laughs> and uh, so it was a very, very difficult time. And after two years of being there alone, we got to our conference that year, and the mission told me, the field council says, we're not going to let you go back. You're going to have to move. Well, I decided I was a total failure. I had to say, I mean, I was going to go back. I was ready to go back. But you know, they say when you're going crazy, you don't, you're the last one to notice it. Everybody else notices it first. <laughs> but they said I couldn't go back. Well, for a whole week, that whole conference, I cried every day. And they'd given me several places that I could decide if there's ministries I wanted to move into. And uh, so finally, the last day of conference, because they said, you're not going back. So you may as well, you're going to have to come up with, tell us which one of these other places you want to go to. Well, I said, okay, I'll go to Singo. Now, believe me, after I got to Singo, a team of horses couldn't have taken me back to Almater <laughs> because it was a, over here, it was such a, a very difficult work. And I get to Singo and you had the other people, other missionaries there, a big staff, and I didn't have responsibilities for the airstrip. You know, I always had to walk up and down the airstrip because the people would throw their coconut hulls on there, which will just rip the tires out of the airplane. I was always nervous. I'm afraid he's going to cut a flip on my airstrip, and, and it's going to be my fault. And so all these pressures. But got to say, God, I didn't have those pressures. But they put me in a building that I will not call a house. It was not a house. It was a building. And when I moved out, they decided that that wasn't fit for human habitation, so... <laughs> But it was one long building. It had a bedroom, living room, kitchen, study. Uh, it had screens to almost all the way around it. We didn't have windows, just had the screens. And these were good screens. I mean, the rats 
could have mutually, you know, the others, they had holes in them, but this didn't. And uh, you didn't hear me say bathroom, did you? There was no bathroom, there was a path out back. So I moved into this house, and I was pretty low emotionally. You know, I'd had to move, they told me I had to go, and I'm over here, and uh, I'm pretty discouraged, and my study down here just had a table along there, that was before the computers, and everything had to be done by hand. And when you're trying to analyze the language and get the alphabet, you get these little, try to make these patterns, so you're moving your little pieces of paper around and, and everything, and I had that down there. And, and I was making good progress. The people were responsive, they were glad to see me there, and I'm beginning my confidence is building up, and I'm, I'm beginning to, I'm coming along pretty good, and I'm making really good progress in the language. And one night we had a big, hard, hard rainstorm with the wind just whipping round and round and round. Well, I uh, got up with my flashlight, you know, didn't have electricity. I came into the living room, so I moved everything right into the middle of the floor because rain was coming in on both sides the way the wind was whipping around. I got into the kitchen, the wind had blown the door open. No big deal. The floor's got big cracks in it. Just washed my kitchen floor, no problem. But I got into the study that had the screen on three sides. And at least 95% of my work was destroyed. Folks, I lost it. I lost it. I tell people I wasn't just angry at God, I was plumb mad. <laughs> I was so mad. And I tell God, I did this all for you. I did all this hard work, and I did it all for you, and you don't even care. You could have kept it from getting destroyed. You could have done that, and you didn't do it. You told me you'd never leave me, and you did so. You said you'd go with me to the end of the earth, and you didn't do it. I said, you put me here in the middle of this jungle, and you don't even remember where you put me. I look back on it now, you know, I was accusing him of not being there, but I was talking to him, you know, we we, we, we got crazy, you know. But anyway, I, w I was just telling God how awful, how bad he was, and how he hadn't kept his promises, and I was gathering all this up, and I put it on the floor under the table, and I'm just crying and crying and just really telling the Lord, you know, just telling him off. And I got back into my bed and pulled the sheet up over my head, and I was crying into my pillow. A big puff of wind came through and something hit me on top of the head. I thought, that is the last straw. That is, that's it. So I got my flashlight to see what it was. It was a little plaque that I had hanging over my bed that said, he cares for you. Amen. I started to giggle through my tears. Okay, God, I get the point. Some people God speaks to in a still, small voice. Some of us he has to conk on the head. <laughs> and uh you know, you know, folks, I learned some really good things about God that day. Yeah. I learned that he can take it. <laughs> he can take anything we dish out. You know, sometimes we, we're just so overburdened, but we don't want to accuse God, do we? We don't want to tell him what's in our heart. He already knows what's in our heart. We better as well just tell him. He already knows it. And he's a big God. He can take it. And he'll, he'll find a way to get through to us, even if he has to conk us on the head. But I was, I was, I'm not proud of the fact that I got so angry at God, but I'm so proud, so proud of the lesson I learned, Amen. of his love, how much he, he loves us. He loves us when we're, you know that song, he loves us when we're bad, and he, <laughs> he, he loves us and, and finds a way. He can see through the hurts and through the problems and see through and, and come to us in a way. And I saved that plaque, I have brought it home with me, and I'm gonna keep that because I remember that God finding a way to let me know that I haven't left you, I'm still here, and I love you. So serving God sometimes is, is, is tough. Now, let me ask you folks, how many of you ever heard somebody give a testimony and they said, God spoke to my heart and I put it off, and I just resisted and resisted and resisted, and finally I surrendered. If you've ever heard that kind of testimony, raise your hand. Now, young people pay good attention to this. How many of you have ever heard somebody get up and say, I resisted God's will for a long, long time. Finally, I surrendered to it. And I've regretted it ever since. Never. Never. 
So young people, what are you afraid of? Hey. Surrendering to the Lord, you will never, ever regret it. There's never been anybody that's regretted it. And so it's, 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 you're going to have tough experiences no matter who you are, where you are. As long as you're a human and living in this world, you're going to have tough experiences. And when you surrender and commit your life to the Lord, you're still going to have tough experiences. But you're going to have his peace and his joy and the privilege of, of knowing him. And uh, just share this with you. Tonight you're going to see the uh, video of when we went into to the headhunters, and that was just so, so exciting. But uh, I was getting ready to come home, and this will not show up on the DVD because the DVD stops. It'll stop when we're saying a, a church that they had built, and that church fell down. It was, you know, they just build these native-stop structures. They, every few months you got to rebuild the church. Well, just before I came home, we sent some of our men up with a chainsaw, sawed the trees down, and just made it into a rough lumber and, and built the church and put a zinc roof on it. And hopefully these churches are going to stand a little bit longer. So all through those villages, <clears throat> we'd help them to build a church. Well, a number of years ago, Bowater, you'll hear, you'll hear about b Doe and the others, so you'll hear that tonight. But Bowater was the chief of one of these villages. You get to be chief, the one that's killed the most people. Bowater was the chief. And over here in Vahabus, that first village, Sido had just died. And Bowater, he asked me, he says, Sido never did ask God to save him, did he? And I said, no, he didn't. He said, he went to hell, didn't he? I said, I'm afraid he did. Bowater says, well, can I do that? Can I ask him to save me? He sure can. So we're standing out in the yard in the middle of the village, and uh, Bowater prayed and asked God to forgive him and asked God to save him. And uh, on that book back there, that's his picture on the front of that book. But Bowater, after he prayed, I said, Bowater, who's your father now? He says, God's my father. Amen. I said, God's my father. Amen. So I said, what does that make us? He says, we're brother and sister. You're right, we're brother and sister. So, you know, we've got brothers and sisters over there who've killed and eaten people. And Bowater was my brother. Bowater was my brother. And I thought of joy. And, but we'd help them build the church, and we went up to help them dedicate it. And again, for the ones who know my brother Stan, they, he came over there to help me as I was saying goodbye to the people that I love so much. And uh, he was over there with me, and we went up to that village to dedicate their church. And it was it's so exciting to see these people who've killed and eaten people sitting there. And they sit on the floor. They don't want benches. They sit on the floor worshiping the Lord. And uh, we came out getting ready to get back in our boat to come home. And Bowater came over to me and he says, Nona, thank you for coming. He says, you brought us out of the darkness into the light. He said, thank you for telling us how we could go to heaven. And I thought, what an what a ending for 40 years to hear Bowater say that. Bowater's still there. I saw him last year, still serving the Lord. But what a, what a thrill to... And you know, so you look back at all the malaria attacks, all the discouragements, all the problems just fade into nothing when you think of the glorious privilege, the glorious joy to, of, of serving him and being able to hear such as that when Bowater says, thank you for telling us how we could go to heaven. And there's no greater joy that God could ever give me than, than giving me that joy of just being able to just to serve him. And, uh, so and, uh, thank you again, folks, for letting me come. And uh, I hope you will come back tonight to see the most exciting thing that I ever got to do in 40 years on the mission field. Let me tell you about when I left. I left the field. It was a very difficult thing because I felt like I, I thought I was never, I would never go back again. And I've been there for 40 years. And these people, I mean, this was my family. Just a couple of days before I was to come home, somebody died. And when they died, they just go out and they roll in the mud and they bury them out there in the jungle. And uh, so I was out there and I was very dirty. I had on flip-flops, a pair of culottes, a tank top, and there were bugs all over me. And I was sitting on a log waiting for them to close up the, close the, the, the hole, you know. And so I, I was very dirty because they had been rolling in the mud and... and uh, I was sitting there, you know, slapping mosquitoes and picking bugs off of me, and I was dirty and, and sweaty and hot, and I was thinking, I'm at home. I know the culture. I know what's expected of me. I know what to do. I know what to say. This is home. 
this here was not home. I didn't fit here, this was not home. And uh, when I got ready to leave, uh, they had receptions and all sorts of things, you know, the, different, the Indonesian language church did a big reception. And, and then, uh, but the Chitek people that morning, they, they, they've they been decided the way you see somebody off properly, they stand outside their window and play their guitars and sing all night. So, you know, I, I was absolutely, totally exhausted because I had to get rid of everything, almost everything I owned, brought home just a couple of suitcases. And so I was getting ready to leave. And I was awake all night that night. I was exhausted. I was very tired. And the plane came, and I was just a, a not far, just a little piece to the airstrip from the house. And I came out of the house, and all the Cheetah people were there. They were mourning like they do when somebody dies. They were mourning, and they were crying, and they were holding on to me. And it took about 45 minutes to get to my house, just out to the airplane. And then I couldn't get on. I'd start to get on the airplane, then pull it back off again and crying and mourning, and it was, it was really, really hard. It was so hard to get on that airplane and fly away, and I, think, I felt like everybody I knew died at one time. All of these people, they died, and I thought I would never go back again. Uh, they all died at one time. But getting on that airplane, I remember getting on the airplane, and, and uh, actually the pilot had to come and get between us. He had to push the people that way and push me onto the plane and close the door because that's the only way we could get away. And looking out there at those people, and uh, I thought, I'll probably never see these people again until we get to heaven. We're going to get to get, see them again in heaven. And, uh, you know, it was just being able to, to love those people and call them my family, and they were my family, and still are. The ones that are still there are my family. And we're all going to get to be together in heaven forever. And I'm going to get to introduce you to some of my headhunter friends. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Pat.